Please turn with me in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 2. Ezra chapter 2. Uh, we have a, a short text today, and we have no outline today. Um, but I'd really then today like for you just to, uh, to soak in what I'm going to say. Um, I would hate for the outline to, to somehow get in the way of that. There's plenty of space to take notes. There's going to be a few words that I end up putting on the screen just to drive home the point. But um, more than anything, what I want you to do is, is to listen and to hear the way that God is at work in us and through us today. Ezra chapter 2, beginning at verse 64. Uh, Ezra has been describing, first in the first chapter, as we saw last week, that King Cyrus has, has told the people, go back to Jerusalem, go uh, return to the land, go restore the city. And, um, and then what Ezra's been doing throughout the second chapter is, is basically taking a census of all the people who've gone back. And so, uh, verse 64. The whole assembly together was 42,360, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 200 male and female singers. Their horses were 736, their mules were 245, their camels were 435, and their donkeys were 6,720. Raise your hand if you've heard a, a message on this text before. Okay, no one. Um, <laughs> there's probably a reason for that. Um, we've, uh, we've been reading about the story of, of Ezra and Nehemiah this week. If you've been following along in the, in the Bible plan, you've been um, seeing that, that God has, has called his people back. And, and something that I, I saw this week that uh, I never realized before, something that's really quite startling, uh, it ties in with what we've been reading about in the book of Exodus as a church, as we've been doing this Bible reading plan. Um, you remember when the people left Egypt, right? They, they left Pharaoh, they left slavery in large numbers. Uh, we're told that in Scripture it says that about 600,000 fighting men left Egypt when they left slavery. And, and the general rule of thumb is that usually for every four non-fighting people, there's one army person, right? And so, um, so basically, uh, the math says there were probably 600,000 fighting men and 2.4 million non-fighting men, whether it's women or children or older men or younger men, whatever, right? So, uh, so about 3 million people left Egypt. And here in Ezra 2, we see a very different number of people leaving Babylon, people leaving this time of exile. Uh, if we include the servants they took with them, there's less than 60,000 people that go back. And it caused me to wonder this week, does this sound too good to be true? Here's a little review. Um, an unbelieving king named Cyrus issued this decree. Go back to Jerusalem. I say unbelieving king because this is a king who doesn't know God, who doesn't know what scripture says, who didn't want to follow what God's will is. King Cyrus, of all people, decides to let God's people go. And as Pastor Jim showed us last week, he was put on his heart by the Spirit of God. And, and he was convicted that this was something he should do. And, and he was used as an instrument in the hand of God. And, and here he is fulfilling the promise that God had made that the people would be in, in captivity for 70 years and they'd be set free. And, and it almost sounds too good to be true. Because why would someone who's defeated a people turn around just one day, you know what, I think that they should go free. I mean, just, just think of it in, in more modern terms. Can you imagine if, if after Hitler had, had defeated France and had taken over Paris, all of a sudden one day he wakes up and he says, you know what, um, Parisians, I want you to go back. And, you know, I took all this artwork from your museums. I want you to, to go back and take it all back with you because that'll be a really nice start for you. Or can you imagine if in today's world, if, if there was a stronghold that ISIS had and, and they, they wiped out all, you know, they got all the Christians out of the city and they got all the Jewish people out of the city and then all of a sudden one day the leader wakes up and he says, 
you know, I want them to have Mosul back. That would sure be nice for them to, to have their city back. Well, why, don't, why don't we send them back and allow them to take that back over, right? It's, it's just, it sounds too good to be true. And then the king gives them the things that God had promised earlier. Remember, God said to Abraham, I will give you a land to live in. And this becomes the promised land. And we just saying about crossing over the Jordan, right? That there's these spiritual truths of going into the promised land. And for us as Christians, it means going into heaven. That, that God, that's the, the place that God has reserved for us. But, but, but King Cyrus, wicked King Cyrus, says, I want you to go back and have the land that God promised to you. Too good to be true. And then God not only gave them the land, but God gave them himself. Throughout the Old Testament with the tabernacle and with the temple, what this is is a place for God to dwell. What this is is a place where they could see that God himself was with them. And so wicked King Cyrus says, you know what, I'm going to give you some of the things that we took from the temple, that Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, and I want you to have those things back, and I want you to have all kinds of gold and silver and all kinds of materials, and I'm going to pay for your work to be done, and so I'm going to make sure all the laborers are well paid so they can do what they're supposed to do. And so wicked King Cyrus gives them a place where they can go and meet God and a place where they can know that God himself is with them. And you think, this sounds too good to be true. And maybe that's why there were just 60,000 people who took the king and ultimately God up on the deal to go back. It would be telling, I think, if, if Ezra not only did a census of all the people who went back, but also a census of all the people who said no. We're fine just where we are. We're good, because this is too good to be true. Yet for those who went, as we've been seeing and will see, they saw that, that God was true, that God kept his promises. They saw that it was everything that he said it would be. And, and yes, there were, of course, difficulties along the way. We read about some in Ezra 4 this week, and we'll see next week when we, th we think about those ideas. But overall, God was good and faithful and true. His plan of returning and restoring his people was happening. Now, I want to tell you this morning that God is still in the business of returning and restoring. And I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to live into that, to respond to God's call for you today. Not to show how faithful you are, but to show how faithful God is in keeping his promises. I want to tell you an extended story this morning that's going to take the majority of the rest of our time uh, and it's one that's close to my heart, not only because it took place less than two weeks ago, um, but also because it's someone that's, uh, that's close to my heart, and I'm amazed at how God has showed his faithfulness in it. I want to tell you the story of, of my Uncle Ed. Um, my Uncle Ed is my, my dad's brother, Ed Boltice. He had always been a fairly close relative, but I think I really got to know him best during my freshman year of college. Uh, during my freshman year, I sent letters to all of our family members to ask how cancer had affected their lives. Um, we have a bunch of, of cancer in my dad's side of the family tree. At the time, when I was 18, um, my grandpa Boltice had died of leukemia. My grandma Boltice had died of lung cancer. My dad had had level 3 melanoma. His other brother had lung cancer, and one of his sisters had lymphoma at the time. I wasn't kidding about cancer, right? And so um, my Uncle Ed's response about how cancer affected him absolutely broke my heart. He said not only had he lost his dad to cancer and his mom to cancer, but also he lost his faith in God to cancer. His dad died when he was six or seven years old, and his mom died when he was in his early 30s. And it shook him to his core. And he gave up his faith because of it. And it was then that I started praying for my Uncle Ed. About seven years later, ten years ago, I'm going to do a lot of reading, not because I don't know this by heart, but because if I don't, I'll start bawling in front of you, and it's going to get ugly. So um, I'm reading this with a purpose, just so you know. Um, about seven years later, ten years ago, I had a year-long internship in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, while there, our church joined with other churches in the area for a campaign called Serve the City. And, and what that meant was that we did combined worship services, and we had service projects that we did together. And, and maybe most importantly, we committed together uh, to pray for the lost. And so our church had this, this beautiful, it was like an 
eight foot by ten foot mural in, in the back of, of the church, and it, and it had the skyline of Cedar Rapids at night, and so it's just this, this beautiful mural, and so uh, on a certain Sunday, uh, each of us in the church took these, these silver sharpies and wrote the names of people we'd be praying for, people that we knew didn't know God yet, but we just kept praying God, please work in their hearts. God, send your Holy Spirit to work in them. God, turn them around and bring them back to you. And so still in Cedar Rapids, they have that mural up, and there's still uh, a two-name name on the back of that mural that says Uncle Ed. As the years went by, Uncle Ed's health deteriorated. He was diagnosed with MS at one point, along with cancer at another point. Um, many of you know that my mom passed away about two and a half years ago, but what you probably don't know is that one of the last people that she spent time with was my Uncle Ed. In fact, the day before she passed away, uh, she took him to the hospital for his chemo treatment. She pushed him in the wheelchair, and she did this not only as a way to simply love him, but as a way to show him the love of God with the hope that it would somehow stick, that it would somehow make an eternal difference for him not knowing that less than 24 hours later she would enter eternity herself. So 10 days ago, March 2nd, I received a phone call. Uncle Ed was in hospice care now. He was in the last season of his life. One of my cousins had been looking for every opportunity she could to present the gospel to him to see if he could maybe somehow receive salvation at the last minute. So far, she hadn't been successful. I was told that Uncle Ed had been having dreams the last two or three nights. That every night he'd have these nightmares that he went to hell. And in hell, he saw horrible things that just scared him completely. And so he saw uh, former pets that they had being tortured in front of him. He saw some of the things, unfortunately, that's made ISIS famous happen right in front of him. He's having these nightmares that just couldn't figure out. And he said he wanted me to come and talk with him. I was still recovering from surgery, still unable to speak without pain in my mouth, and on top of that, I'd been battling the flu all week, going between a fever and the chills. Would you be willing to come talk to him, my cousin asked. In any other situation, <laughs> I would have said, the last thing he needs is, is for me to share a fever and the flu with him when he's in hospice care. Um, it's the same reason I haven't visited some folks in the hospital recently here at church, because I, I would hate to add that to them. But I said to my cousin, and I think this was honestly a, a gift of the Holy Spirit to recognize this, I said to my cousin, you know, if I go see him, this could be the death of him. He's already in hospice care to, to get a really nasty flu bug, and yet, by God's grace, this could be the life of him. This could be the eternal life of him if I go and speak with him and see what God does. The next morning, I, I messaged Uncle Ed's wife, and she said that his day was wide open. So we set it up that I would get there at 9.30 that morning, uh, last Friday, a week ago Friday. I reached out to a handful of prayer warriors in my life. I asked them to pray for strength, for the Holy Spirit's leading, and for his work to be done through me, and they started praying. I emailed my, my sisters and my dad a week ago Friday, and I said, please be praying. I think, I think God's going to do something this morning. And immediately my sister Lisa emailed back, and she said, I think this is the only reason that Uncle Ed is still alive today, so that he can still receive salvation before he dies. Then she emailed back, and she said, I think I want to call Grandma, my almost 90-year-old Grandma, so that she can be praying for him specifically this morning. And about 10 minutes later, she messaged back, and she said, Grandma's completely in tears, and she's promised that she's going to be praying for him all morning. I arrived to see my Uncle Ed with high expectations. His wife said that he was in rare form. I said, what, what does that mean? And she said, this is the most talkative and clear-minded he's been in a while, and he's been singing all morning. I went upstairs to see Uncle Ed, and I began by saying that I'd heard he was having some horrible nightmares, and he agreed going over some of the details. I asked if he'd ever asked Jesus to be his personal Lord and Savior, if he ever asked Jesus into his heart, and he said no. 
I said, do you want to pray about that with me this morning? And he said, no. <laughs> we then talked about all kinds of things. Uh, times growing up in the neighborhood of Inglewood, what it was like for his mom, my grandma, to be a single mom with five little kids. I asked him about the letter, how cancer had taken not only his dad and his mom, but also his faith in God. And he said, I just don't get it. And again, I think, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, I have this insight to, to say to him this morning, well, just because you're mad at God, just because you've pushed God away because of the losses you've had in your life, it doesn't mean you're going to bring those people back. It doesn't mean you're going to win if you somehow have to suffer for all eternity apart from God in hell. That's true, he said. We went down a couple rabbit trails all over the place. It was fun talking with him, and Toward the end of our time, I mentioned in some ways that I was, I was jealous that he was one of the, the last people to spend any amount of time with my mom before she went to heaven. I told him that she didn't just bring him to the hospital to help him, but also to show him God's love. I told him his wife did that every day. I told him that the family that's been seeing him and visiting him has been doing that every day. I, I asked if he remembered my grandma. Oh yeah, of course. I told him that she was praying for him today, that a number of prayer warriors were praying for him today, that my sisters and my dad were praying for him today, that, that God would somehow return him and God would restore him. I asked him again, would you want to pray this morning about this? Yes, he said, let's pray. And so we did. Confessing sin, asking Christ to be his Savior, committing to live with the Holy Spirit for God, accepting the promise of eternal life, to live forever with the Lord in heaven. And I have to tell you, it was amazing. The answers to prayer, the way that God saved him, the way that God worked through me in spite of all my weakness, to him be the glory. And when I left, I told Aunt Chris, she was downstairs waiting and didn't really want to intrude. I, I told Aunt Chris, his wife, what had happened. And, uh, I told her how my grandma had been praying, and she said, you know, a few years ago, your grandma told me that every single day she prays for Uncle Eddie. That every day she prays that, that Eddie would come back to God, that somehow Eddie would be restored to God. How beautiful is that? And so she also said something else about earlier that day. She said, you know, I didn't say it earlier, but the songs that your Uncle Ed have been singing all morning have been church songs been singing songs of the faith, and, and she goes to a Catholic church, and so they're not songs that she's familiar with, but she said, I recognize them, and she said, they're songs that, that he heard as a child, and she said, I, I wonder if God was preparing him and bringing him to this point to be able to receive salvation now. I think so. so really briefly now, I just want to talk about a few lessons from Uncle Ed's story and from Ezra, just a, a few minutes with the time we have left. First, we know that followers of Jesus are the temple, and so we're called to rebuild. Paul teaches us that as Christians, we don't focus on a place. In fact, this is not, this is not the temple of God, but you are the temple of God. And the reason you are called the temple of God is because God's Holy Spirit dwells in you. It's true of every Christian that whoever loves the Lord and wants to serve him, you are a temple of the Lord because God's Holy Spirit dwells in you. And some of the promises that were true in Ezra are true for us. Just like Ezra's people were told, go rebuild the temple. We're called to, to bring people back to relationship with God or, or maybe bring people to a relationship with God for the first time in their life. Our rebuilding the temple, or building the temple, or constructing, or, or maybe we just mix some grout, or maybe, you know, who knows what other little jobs we do, but whatever it is, we're called to rebuild that temple. And that means investing in people's lives. It means doing good for them. It means helping them. It means intentionally saying, how can I show God's love so that they would be convinced, so that they could see and be compelled that God is at work in them, and God is for them. That's our call. Not so much so that we can 
have some sort of promised land, not so that we can have a, a strip of land in the Middle East because that's somehow holy land, nothing like that. Instead, as we sang, crossing over the Jordan, when our life is over, the promised land for us, again, is, is not a strip of land in the Middle East, but the promised land for us is heaven itself. Right? God's promises throughout the Old Testament, God's promises here in the book of Ezra are specifically for those people for a temple, for those people for the land, but for us, for us. They're for people around us that God's called us to restore, to rebuild, to return to him. And isn't it amazing that he calls us to do it? And this morning, dear people of God, I don't want you to think that this is too good to be true. I don't want you to think that this, this is almost impossible because how could it be? It seems too incredible that, that God would work through us in our weakness, that God would work through us when we're sick. God would work through us when we're recovering from surgery. God would work through us to give us the words to say at just the right moment. God would give us the discernment and insight to be able to have the words to say. Some of you can testify and have testified about ways that, that God just gave you the perfect words to say to someone by his grace. And he still does that. Don't give up on that. Instead, trust him and respond to his call. Second, what I learned from this is that we should keep praying. Don't give up. There's this parable that Jesus tells of this persistent widow. He speaks about this widow who, who wants justice to be done, and she keeps bugging this judge, and, and we're told that this judge is corrupt, and this judge is maybe looking for a bribe, and this judge is, is hoping maybe she'll slip him a 20 or something like that, right? And, and so, so Jesus says, eventually, because she persisted, because she kept bugging him, because she kept asking him, because she gave him no peace, eventually he said, fine, you can have it. And Jesus says, God's not like a corrupt judge that we have to somehow slip him a 20 or we have to be better or we have to do certain good things or anything like that. But God is your heavenly father who loves you. And if even a corrupt judge will, will finally relent, how much more so will your father in heaven respond to your prayers? Dear people, I've been praying consistently for my Uncle Ed for 10 years. I first found out about what was going on in his life 17 years ago when I was in college, and, and really about 17 and a half years ago, I'm 35. So half my life, I've been praying for my Uncle Ed, and finally, by God's grace, March 3, 2017, 12 days ago, God did it. Isn't that amazing? And I want to encourage you today to not give up in prayer either. I heard of a story just last week of someone who's, whose kids have, have gotten away from the faith not someone from our church, but, but someone else who, whose kids have gotten away from the faith, and they were so discouraged about it. And it's been a couple years since they've been in church, a couple years since they've shown any signs of, of faith in their lives, and they were so discouraged about that. And, and, and I heard this person say about her children, she said, it seems like they're a lost cause. It's been a couple years. And I hear that, and I hear what, how long it took for Uncle Ed. And, and I only found out 17 years ago, but really, it's, it's been like 45 years since he's shown any signs of life. And, and he's like these trees that are outside that were dormant, right? These trees that, that don't have any buds on them, that don't show any life. You don't cut your trees down every winter because, well, they look dead. No, right? Spring's coming. New life is coming. Resurrection is coming. And that's how it took for Uncle Ed. I told his wife on the way out, I pointed that out to her, and, and she said, well, you think it's, it's been like a 45-year winter for him? And I said, I guess so. But spring is here, right? A new life comes, and resurrection comes to return and to restore. And so I want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop believing, but instead, keep trusting in the Lord that he will answer your prayers, no matter how long it takes. And third, we desire their good, so don't let them cheat themselves. I was thinking about Uncle Ed's story and thinking about this parable from Matthew 20. If you have time today, you can jot down Matthew 20 to, to read it yourself. But to put it simply, this is kind of how the parable goes that Jesus tells. He says that there's a master— who is looking for, for laborers for the day to help him do his work. And, and I'm going to simplify it. But basically, at, at 9 a.m., he sees a guy and he says, hey, can you work for me all day? Work 9 to 5, I'll give you 100 bucks. 
sure, sounds good, I'll work for you all day. And so he hires him on the spot. Around noon, he sees someone else and says, I could really still use some more help. I really want you to work for me. I'll give you 100 bucks to work till 5. Sounds good, I, I can do that for you. So then at 4.30, right? 4.30, he finds a guy and he says, hey, I could still use some more help. If you work till 5, till the end of the day, give you a full day's pay, 100 bucks. Sign me up, sounds great, right? And so at the end of that day, the master is, is paying those who've, who've worked for him. And so the guy who was there at 4.30 worked a half hour. Here's 100 bucks. Guy who was there at noon worked half a day. Here's 100 bucks. Guy who was there at 9 a.m. Here's 100 bucks. And the guy at 9 a.m. says, wait a minute. I've been working for you all day. I've been here the whole day, and I don't get any more than what they got. And the master says to him, I didn't give you any less than what I promised. You got exactly what I promised you. And if I want to be generous with my workers, if I want to give someone technically more than they deserve, that's up to me. And who are you to question me as far as how generous I am? And what Jesus there is, is really talking about is this picture of salvation. And, and <laughs> to, to bring it a little further, I mean, Uncle Ed punched in at 458, <laughs> you know? And, and I hear that, and, and, and even telling my kids about it this week, I said, I said, you know, on the one hand, you look at that and you say, oh, you know, uh, he, really, he really cheated the system, right? And, and he really, oh man, he only had two minutes and he gets a full day. How, how does that work that he gets access to heaven? Well, my grandpa, who lived 90 years, was an elder, he served the Lord, loved the Lord, passed out Bibles as a Gideon, did all this stuff for 90 years of his life. He's in heaven too. How does that make any sense? Well, here's where it makes sense. Uncle Ed didn't cheat God for those 45 years. He cheated himself. Uncle Ed would have been so much better off had he known that he was serving the master when he went to Vietnam. Uncle Ed would have been so much better off when he went through the divorce and losing his daughter in the process. Uncle Ed would have been so much better off when his siblings got sick and he lost his brother and sister-in-law and sister-in-law all at a young age. Uncle Ed would have been so much better off. He would have been so much better off dealing with the MS diagnosis and the cancer diagnosis. He would have been so much better off. He didn't cheat God. He cheated himself. So friends, the call for us, sometimes it works that like the thief on the cross, they receive the Lord at the 11th hour. They, they receive the Lord just before it's time to, to punch out. But they're not doing themselves any favors. And so for the love of those that we know around us, do what you can to share the gospel with them sooner rather than later. Give them the gift of, of working for the master for more of their life rather than less of their life. Help them to know that through all their trials that God is with them, that they can experience that. And then one last thing that I want to ask you this morning. Where do you personally see God's redeeming work? I've been able to see it in a really powerful and beautiful way in my Uncle Ed. But I know that there are glimpses that each of us here have seen. And so what we want to do as a church is, is be a community that's about returning and restoring. We want to be a community that says, how can we do, whether it's a small thing for the Lord or just a, a big thing where we get to see uh, the, the, the harvest of the Lord, where have we seen in our lives just glimpses of redemption. Easter is about a month away, and I'd love for us as a church, whether I'm reading the stories on your behalf, or whether we take video beforehand, or whether you share in person, I'd love for us as a church on Easter to celebrate resurrection, to celebrate the new life of Jesus by hearing stories. And, and they might not be, you know, the 11th hour story of salvation as I had this morning, but, but maybe it's a story of, you know, there was this broken relationship with my kids and, and they're starting to text me again. And it's a glimpse of God's redemption in our stories. Maybe it's, you know, they're not coming to church yet, but every once in a while they watch online and they're hearing the gospel and they're seeing what God can do in their lives. Maybe it's seeing little minor baby step improvements in our health where we say, you know what, God is redeeming this and God is restoring this and I'm seeing signs of new life. 
I don't know what it is in your life, but I know that it is in your life. And so I want to encourage you and challenge you uh, to pray those things over. Last week, Pastor Jim mentioned that we should, we should just pray that we would have eyes to see what God is doing in our lives. And this is really a reinforcement of that same idea. Not only eyes to see, but also mouths to speak, right? Or fingers to type what God's doing in our lives. Because how encouraging would that be for all of us to say, yes, God is still at work. Yes, God is still returning and redeeming and restoring those to himself. That's what God is doing in our lives, and I hope and pray you've been encouraged this morning. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we are amazed at your grace, your grace that seems almost too good to be true. God, thank you that my Uncle Ed found you not a moment too soon. God, I pray that you would um, continue to hold him in your care in his last days of life. For others here this morning or that we know, we lay them at your feet and pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would cause people to be in rare form, ready to receive the gospel from us. God, I pray that you would help us to be people who are unafraid to go with you, unafraid to respond to your call, unafraid to say, God, use me in the returning and restoring work that you do. God, we love you. We thank you for hearing our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' holy name.